be here in this class this morning. Let's open our Bibles in the 14th chapter of the book of John. And I believe there's some things that are <clears throat> very, very important about the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. I'm afraid that uh, <clears throat> as Christians we, we get used to, uh, say, the doctrine of soul winning or the doctrine of the second coming, uh, whatever the doctrine might be. And uh, I've looked at this thing from this uh, viewpoint. Uh, what is the need for me here? What does this do for me? Uh, the second coming does, uh, the doctrine does do some things for us. And what does it do? The Bible said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And I've studied the Bible, as your pastor has, on the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. And I've watched denominations that uh, took this doctrine uh, out of their church, and I've watched those churches die. And I've watched those denominations and schools die. So I've... Uh, come up with the idea that the second coming of Christ will do some things for you. I, I had a man ask me here a while back. He was a dying man, a very wealthy man in the Raft Meat Company, one of the head executives. And Joe Brown asked me this question. He said, uh, he was talking about the second coming. And, uh, and I said, Joe, are you really saved? And he said, oh, yes. He said, I'm, I'm a saved man. And he told me when he got saved, and I, I guess maybe he was. He lives right there by me. And, and uh, as I began to talk to him, and he said, there's one thing, Brother Wood, I, I can't relate. He said, uh, what's God going to do about the heathen that has never been uh, saved, that's never heard the gospel? And, and I sat down and looked at him a minute, and I said, Joe, what are you going to do about the heathen? Well, what have you done for the heathen? He told me how he had invested his money and how that when he was gone, he was expecting to die, which he did die. He told me how that his wife would be wealthy and she'd never have another worry and how that he'd take care of everything. But he wanted to know what God was going to do about the heathen. I said, Joe, God told me and you what to do about the heathen. God told me and you to go to all the world and preach the gospel. And so it's not God's obligation, it's mine and yours. And so man's laid down on his obligation. So I'll, I'll tell you what God's going to do with the heathen. God's going to stand you and I at the judgment seat. And the blood is going to be dripping from our hands, not God's hands. Amen. And the doctrine of the second coming will do something for you. The first thing it'll do, it, it'll give comfort to a bereaved heart. Now, if you have your Bible, look here, please. I taught this in my Sunday school class, and I, I believe it'll be good here this morning. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and uh, uh, verse 18, the Bible said, Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. Now, what words is that? Well, the, the, the preceding uh, seven, eight verses of Scripture is dealing with Christ shall come again and catch us away to be with Him forever. And uh, people used to ask me 30 years ago when I pulled out of the religion that I was in, uh, the Baptist, and uh, they said, why are you going out? I said, well, they left out the doctrine of the second coming. They said, well, how important is that? Well, I don't know. But in the New Testament, it's mentioned 300 and 18 times. So anything that's mentioned 318 times, that would be every 22 verses in the Bible. The Lord In the New Testament, the Lord said, I will come again. There's some books here, like 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, that is dedicated completely to the coming of the Lord. Why did He do it? Well, He knew that you and I would have difficult times. We'd even have some disappointing times. We'd have times, not only that, but... Times of death or disaster or difficulties, disease, whatever. He said, comfort ye one another with these words. And so I, I believe that the greatest comfort in the Bible, the Lord was fixing to go away. And he told the disciples, he said, now, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Then he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now, why did he tell them that? He knew that these men were going to face some real difficult times in the days ahead. And he wanted them to have some comfort in their heart. It's comfort to know that this is not the end. 
uh, if you're going through some trials, as every family is, uh, I'm uh, facing some things in the morning that I've never faced before. The next week, I'm facing some things I've never faced before. But this is not the end. The Lord is coming back again. Amen. And uh, it's comfort to us to know that uh, when we come to the... Uh, I have a... My dad and I have served God together for all these years. I guess I've been my mother and dad's pastor about maybe 18 years, 17, 18, 19 years. I've been my mother and dad's pastor. But uh, they're getting old and feeble now. And my dad's had four or five strokes. I went by here a while back. He's bad sick. And I said, Dad, I, I, I'm not going to leave town and you're this sick. He said, Ah, oh, you run on, boy. I said, uh, I'll be all right. He said, uh, If I'm not here when you get back, I said, I'll see you when you get to the other side. He said, you don't have to worry about it. The Lord's coming. And, you know, uh, Papa said, you don't have to worry about it. Well, he served God all these years, and, uh, and I have. And so uh, that's a great comfort to the bereaved. And it's wonderful to take a church family and go out. And I've had to do it so many times in 32 years and lay a little baby down in the clay and cover it up and tell the mother, listen, this is not the end. This is not the end. The Lord's coming, and this body is going to rise out of that grave. My dad and I stood at the... A, a grave here a, while, a good while back. A sister of his died, the last one of them, and uh, of the seven girls. And we walked over there, and his dad and mother were Christians, and uh, he wiped the uh, uh, pine needles off them tombstones, and he said, well, it won't be long, Jack. It won't be long. He said, the Lord will be here, and uh, these tombstones will be gone, and we'll meet our family again. That's, 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 that's for the bereaved heart. So the second coming of Christ is a very important doctrine because it uh, does something for the bereaved heart. And then, the second thing I want you to know. But Tom, what time are we supposed to stop in here? The bell ring. All right, when the bell rings, well, I know it's time to come out fighting. All right, all right. So, uh, uh, this uh, doctrine gives a key that opens the book of God. Now, there's no other uh, key in the Bible. There's no other doctrine in the Bible. It is absolutely a key. Now, um, uh, Calvin said, John Calvin, uh, that great reformer, he said the book of Revelation is a closed book. Well, if you read his uh, books, uh, there's a lot of stuff closed to him. And the reason it was closed to him, because he knew nothing about the second coming of Christ. Now, if you take the second coming of Christ out of the uh, New Testament, then uh, you'll, have a, you'll have a strange book. You'll have a strange book. You'll be, you'll be talking to yourself. Now, it's more than just another doctrine. It is a science of interpreting the Word of God. Now, if you have your Bible, look here just a moment. My mother used to say to me, she was a, a Baptist, and uh, they believed the world was getting better and better and better and better, and uh, one day we, we, it's going to get so good that we was, the, we was the stone, the church was the stone, you and I the mountain, and if we'd come rolling in, we'd get everything straightened up. Then we had a world war. Well, that kind of tore that doctrine up. Now, if you have your Bible, look in Luke chapter 1 and verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy wound and bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the, of the Highest. Now, Brother Wood, is that literally talking? Yes, it's literally talking. It said there's going to be a virgin-born Son of God. Is that what verse 31 says? Yes. That's what that teaches that. All the way here, we've got a virgin boy. He should be great, was he? Yes. He's the son of the highest. In other words, he's the only begotten son of God. Is that literal? I'm trying to teach you something this morning. That's the literal interpretation, all right? And he shall, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Is that literal? That's literal. Peter preached that on the day of Pentecost. Now, here's what the average religion denomination, so like some of the great uh, Presbyterian churches, and uh, there was a time when men like uh, Moody and, uh, and uh, men like uh, Billy Sunday and those Presbyterians, they, they were premillennial, believed in the second coming of Christ. But they said, no, no, wait a minute. They said, there's not going to really be a millennium. That's just spiritually talking. And so what they did, they spiritualized that verse of Scripture. All right, then that gives them permission to spiritualize any scripture that they don't understand and they want to spiritualize. So when you spiritualize his throne, then I have a right to spiritualize his birth. If I spiritualize his throne and say, well, that really doesn't mean a literal throne. 
Well, then I can say that doesn't mean a literal birth. That doesn't really mean that he really was the Son of God. That's just figurative talking. Now, this is why uh, denominations go into modernism. You'll never find a modernist that believe in the premillennial second coming of Christ. Because it's the key that unlocks the book. It's a literal interpretation of the Word of God. Now, the Bible is literal unless God says it's figurative. Now, you don't have the right to take the Bible and turn it and say, well, now, really, he didn't mean a throne. What did he mean? He said he'd be on David's throne. Now, where is he going to sit when he gets back, Brother Jack? On David's throne in Jerusalem. That's the only, that's the only interpretation that will open the book. And when you believe that, why, well, everything else is so simple. You're just waiting for the king to get back. Amen? Amen. All right. So uh, it gives a key that opens the book of God. Now, the book of Revelation, without the second coming of Christ in the fourth chapter, when we shall go up to meet him in the air, or rather, uh, he'll catch the right away. That's what he's talking about there. Well, without that, uh, you, have a, you just have a closed book. So it unveils the, the, the key that unlocks the book. It unveils the past. Uh, Daniel is not history. Daniel is what's going to happen in the future. The 11th chapter of Isaiah, the lamb's going to lay down with the lamb. How do you interpret that? Or you say, well, brother, well, that really doesn't mean that. What does it mean? Well, that means they're going to get to heaven, they, the lion. Ain't going to be no lions in heaven. Ain't nothing about, about lions. The, the Bible said that a lion is going to lay down with the lamb. When? That'll be during the millennial reign of Christ. And the only way you can interpret that is that you've got to get the key that unlocks the book. So it unveils the past. It reveals the present. We, we see all these ecumenicalism going together. You say, what's going on, Brother Wood? All the churches are racing back to Rome. Everybody's coming together. That's exactly what the Bible said. Hey, there's no use you getting up in the pulpit and denouncing all that and, and, uh, and talking about how bad the world's getting. That's exactly what God said he's going to do. No use even, uh, you know, you can warn your people about it, but there's no use to uh, get out on the League of Nations and what they're doing. Why, God said they was going to do that. I mean, that's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. All right. So uh, it uh, shows us the present, but then it pulls back the curtain and shows us the future. So let religion come together. God showed us that, that uh, religion and communism and all that in the book of Revelation, they'll all be joined together, but you and I will be gone. What do we care? Amen. So there's no use you, uh, in this day and time, we hear some people coming out pretty strong against uh, some uh, uh, big religions of our day. There's not much use spending your time on it. Because God said it's going to be like a green bay tree. So uh, there's no, not much use spending your time. Now, it gives a key that opens the book of God. Now, the third thing I want you to know, it gives an incentive to live a holy life. Now, uh, you might not agree with me, but uh, open your Bible just a minute in 1 John. It gives an incentive. Uh, what does the second coming of Christ do? It gives comfort to the bereaved, but a little more than that. A little more than that. Uh, it gives a key that opens a book. It shows us some things that nobody else knows. But uh, in chapter 3 of 1 John, verse 1 through 3, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now, some people say that you'll be saved, maybe, when you meet the Lord. There's religion to teach that. But this Bible said, now are we the sons of God. That's right now. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, the Bible uh, gives us an incentive here to live for the Lord. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now, I'll give you this as a kid. My daddy was a trader, a mule trader. And uh, my dad would uh, always have three or four little pickups and uh, had little trailers behind him. And they'd, uh, they'd ship a load of mules somewhere and back in the 30s. And uh, Papa, he'd go off. He said, now, Jack, you behave yourself. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to. Well, we had a bow right behind our house. We call them bows, and had a bow run right behind the house. And and uh, back in the, in the 30s, they dumped all of the sewage in it and everything else. It was the nastiest place in the world. But on a hot day, it looked pretty nice to a boy, you know, live there. And so, soon, boy, I'm in that water all the time. Daddy said, Jack, I'll beat you to death 
You're going to die with typhoid. You're going to drown in that mess. Uh, Jack, stay out of that thing. Well, you know, I, my church is right there today by that Bible, that same Bible, same Bible, right where I spent my life. And every time I go by there, I can feel my daddy whooping me every time I see that Bible. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Mama say, uh, Jack, Jack, uh, we got a little telegram. Uh, your dad's coming. Uh, for about two or three days, I mean, I knew he was coming. I mean, I got my act all together. I'd been as mean as the devil for 10 days. But I'll guarantee you about two or three days before Papa got there, I mean, I cleaned the yard. I mean, I washed down the house. I mean, I fed all the stock. I'd done everything that a boy's supposed to do. And uh, he'd come in and said, well, how's that boy been? She said, well, pretty good last two or three days. <laughs> yeah, y'all, I see some of y'all nodding. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Amen. Well, that really gave me an incentive to live, uh, uh, shape up a little bit. Amen. And, and a Christian who is saved, uh, we, we find that. We was reading over in Thessalonians a while ago. And uh, each one of us here who studied the Bible, we know that 1 Thessalonians 4 deals with the, with the, the Christians, uh, the Lord coming. But 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 said, For this is the will of God, even our sanctification. And a lot of people come to me all the time and they say, Brother Wood, I don't know God's will for my life. I do. I know the will of God for everybody's life. The will of God for your life is that you live a clean life before the Lord. You just be faithful to the Lord. And anything else God wants you to do when He comes by, He'll tell you. I mean, that, that's no problem. I see people fretting over the will of God. I never have done that. I, I've just never experienced it. I had a premillennial pastor that taught me as a young Christian that uh, if I would be faithful to the Lord, and, and why don't you remember one time about 12 or 14 years ago, I didn't have a church or nothing. I went and I joined the church. I got in that church. I lived for the Lord. I, I did everything in that church. I, I just tried to be one of the best members. And the pastor came to me, Brother Charles Kimball, and he said, you know, you're the first preacher that ever joined my church. He was a faithful member. I said, well, I, I believe the preacher ought to be the most faithful member in the church. Amen. Yeah. Somebody say amen. Yeah. I mean, that, that's true. Uh, Brother John Thompson, uh, you, uh, I'm not saying it because he's here, but he's one of the most faithful men i got. I mean, he's got a ministry of his own, and, and he's busy in that ministry. And I never see him during the week, but Wednesday night, Brother John's in his place. I mean, Thursday night for visitation, Brother John's right there. I guarantee you, Saturday night prayer meeting, Brother John's in town. He said Saturday night prayer meeting. He's a faithful man. And I've got two or three men like him and Dan Metters. And they have a ministry of their own. But those men are faithful. They're local church. I mean, they bring their wives and children. And they come around and raise their children. Them kids are not drifting to every church in town, roaming around. Uh, they, oh, no. Them children know exactly where their Sunday school class is. Amen? Amen, Brother Wood. That's wonderful. I like that. It gives an incentive to live a holy life. Why? Because of an expectancy of the soon return of our blessed Lord. You said, Brother Wood, do you really believe he's coming? No. No, I don't believe that. I know that. And he could come today. I, I'm going to tell you what, I, 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 I've argued with the Lord. I said, there is nothing else to do. Most Christians don't want to live for God. I mean, saved people don't want to live for God. And people got different ideas. And uh, there's not a great move of going on of souls being saved. That's not a, that's not a great a world of anger. It just looks like to me that this is the hour. Now, wickedness is like a green bay tree. And so it just looks like to me that this would be a good time for the Lord to come. It looks like, it looks like to me that we are right there at the door at the end time. Now, I don't know anything else in the Bible that has to happen. There's nothing that has to happen. And every sign... Uh, pointing to the great tribulation, I believe we can see it. We can see it. We've never, oh, you said, Brother Wood, it's always been, I beg your pardon, it never, ain't never been like it is now. Now, this gives me an incentive that the Lord is going to soon return. And then uh, this gives me an incentive because of his secret return. In other words, I don't know when he's coming. Now, I knew when my dad was coming, so I straightened up. But I don't know when the Lord's coming. He could come today. He could come tomorrow. He could come five years from now. I have no idea when he's coming. But I know one thing. He said, I will come again. Yeah. Now, I've got his word on it. I've got his word on it. And God thought it was so important that he wrote it down. And I don't know why God put the expectancy in my heart. But I'm expecting the Lord. I played a dirty trick on my wife one time. I, we hadn't been saved. I hadn't been saved but just a few months. And uh, I found out that the Lord was coming. And I went home and told her. I was over in a meeting in another, oh, it was way over 30 years ago. And I came home and I told her, I said, Well, Mom, 
did you know the Lord was coming? She said, when? And, you know, she thought I was talking about right, you know, tonight. And uh, I said, well, he, you know, he could just come any time. I said, now, the Bible said there's going to be a trumpet going to sound, and uh, we're going to lead out of here. And she said, you're kidding me. And we lived out in the country, and I, I drove this guy to do it. And so he come by in his car and stuck a big uh, uh, horn out of that thing and blow that horn. Her eyes got that big around. <laughs> yeah. But I, I tell you, that was an expectancy. Amen. That was an expectancy. Amen. And then uh, uh, there's an expectancy of his secret return. But there's also the expectancy of the surety of his coming. He's coming. There's no doubt about that. There's nobody in this building, oh, you might have pushed it in the back of your mind and you said, I'm busy with material things and busy uh, building your home and your life and everything. You might have pushed it all back. But in the quietness of your life and in your Bible study, every one of you people here that have been raised in an independent Baptist church and grew up and been taught this, you know that the Lord's coming. Yeah, you know that. There's not a doubt in your mind. Uh, why? Well, you, that's actually, Brother Tom, one of them convictions that the average person would die with. Just as sure as I knew he'd come the first time and died for me, I know he's coming the second time without sin unto salvation. And you and I are going to rise to meet the Lord now. And uh, I honest, honest before the Lord. I've talked to my wife about it. I've talked to uh, Brother Carl Lackey about it. And Brother Carl told me that we were talking about it the other day. I believe that it's now. I really believe it. Honest in my heart, I believe it's now. I believe religion, uh, the Baptists and the Catholics and the Presbyterian, they've all come back together. They've all come together. They're together. The world is all back together. And since the world's all back together, and uh, there's never been a time in America when God's people are hated and persecuted. Now, if you go to a rest home like we did just the other day, and uh, one of my men got up and preached a very uh, a very uh, toned-down message, but he warned those people, about a hundred of them, that they would go to hell if they died, and a lady called me on the phone. I mean, she's upset. Uh, she said, don't you think that we could do more if we went down and handed out cookies and cakes? Uh, don't you think that that, that that would be better for these old people instead of telling them they're going to hell? Well, the only part about it, darling, is that's where they're going. Now, old age doesn't give you a, an avenue into heaven. Old age will carry you to hell. And here a dear man is with a broken heart and tears in his eyes and free of charge, I mean, warning these people. And I mean, this woman was mad. But she's not the only one. You can preach in a lot of independent Baptist churches, and, and the preachers will get mad at you. Yeah. They say, man, well, I, I just don't believe that's needful. Well, what are you doing? Nothing. So the dead is four o'clock. Amen. Amen. And so people, this gives us an incentive to live a holy life. Now, let me give you the fourth thing here. Maybe you're writing them down. The, sec the doctrine of the second coming of Christ will give us a hope, uh, uh, for, for a burden for people. It'll give us a burden for people. Then in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13, uh, as I read a while ago, in first, uh, 4 13, the Bible says, uh, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, even as others which have no hope. Now, the Bible said at the coming of the Lord, there's some that have no hope. And I believe that God's people ought to be burdened over those who have no hope. You say, well, Brother Wood, this town of Milton is religious. Well, uh, what do you think about Jerusalem when Jesus came? You say, Brother Wood, there's nobody here that uh, believes they're unsaved. How about in Jesus' day? Now, you just take, you say, well, these are the last days. Well, that, that could be true. But we've been in the last days since Pentecost. And you've got to say amen to that. We're in the last days. Amen. But when Jesus came, he was not accepted. He was rejected. He was nailed to a tree for what he believed. And I'm, I'm, I'm completely aware that we are fixing experience at the same time. Who would ever believe 20 years ago that we'd see men like Lester Roloff and Jack Woods and, and these men in jail for what? For preaching the gospel. Who would ever believe? I asked a policeman this other day in Houston. I said, who would ever believe that three drug addicts could get saved or put on 40 pounds of weight I and mean, get them good jobs and go to work and be stable citizens and be arrested and put in a police car because they was preaching in a park with a permit. 
They asked him, said, don't use those bull horns. It, uh, said, one of the monkeys jumped on, broke his neck. They said, all right, sir. I mean, just as congenial as you could be. All right, sir. Put the horn up, stuck them on a little bench, and just preached in with an open mouth. The, the zoo is probably, what, two city blocks over there, John? The word's that, and it's preaching to those people. And I asked the policeman, I said, uh, is it against the law to preach? He said, no. But he said, the people don't want it. I said, well, you know what? I don't want income tax. It don't help me much. He said, but public opinion, Brother Wood, is against preaching. And if they don't want you to preach, they can file charges against you for preaching. One man called me up and said, uh, I'm sick and tired of picking your tracks up. And so me, me being a Christian, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. If some of my people throw them down, I'll come out there and pick them up. He said, your people didn't throw them down. But they gave them to some people, and they throw them down. I said, well, that's just kind of like uh, Budweiser. Yeah. They're out there selling beer, and a guy throws a can down. Budweiser don't come around and pick up every can. Yeah. Amen? Amen. 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 But uh, you see, uh, he don't hate Budweiser, but he hates Jesus Christ. Amen. You got to get that this morning. Oh, you say, Brother Wood, nobody hates Jesus. Well, then Jesus must be a liar. He said, I gave you my word, and he said, they hated me, and they'll hate you. Yeah, that's what he said. That's what Jesus said. I think he knew more about it than you and I did. Now, if any man has his hope, now, the government has suppressed, but one day, the second coming of that, we're going to run the government. I hope the Lord lets me run Houston. I've got a couple of monkeys I'd like to put in jail. All right. The world will be ruled by us with a rod of iron. That's what the Bible says. You see? Religion will be completely done away with. The Bible shows you that. All you got to do, and Brother Tom, you teach this. You've been teaching this for years. I mean, when the Lord comes, that, that city on seven hills is going to be long gone. Yes, sir. He's going to put her away. And, and those that you and I and religion, they so complement one another. When the Lord comes with the sword of his mouth, the Lord will take care of Rome and all of her little children. And that's talking about the little Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians and all of them that's got together and they're all joined hands together against the Lord and his children. God will take care of that. Now, when you read the Bible and study the second coming of Christ, you'll see that. Now, it gives us wisdom. The doctrine of the second coming gives us wisdom to deal with this age. Nations are all becoming one. Religion is all becoming one. And the wicked are beginning to rule over the righteous. And Proverbs said very clearly, when the wicked reign, it said the people mourn. And so we're in that state today. Uh, we've arrived in that latter sea and age uh, and our job is only to rescue the perishing. So it gives us wisdom how to deal with this age. So quit criticizing religion. They're gone. They're gone. The Lord will handle that. That's not your job. He'll take care of that. And many times, you and I are busy about taking care of God's business. Just take care of your own. When he gets here, he'll take care of the rest of it. Amen. I, I see a lot of preachers. They get all in the... Uh, they're involved in different fights and what have you. We're going to organize this and organize that. Uh, the Apostle Paul never called Jerry Falwell and asked him to get him out of jail. Now, I'm glad for what Brother Falwell's doing. I'm glad for what anybody's doing is right. But I'm just telling you that Paul and the, and the New Testament Christians never formed the CLA to fight their cases. Now, you differ with me if you want to. That's all right. But uh, I have a right to. The Bible said that they prayed... And Peter was in jail, and they heard a knock at the door. Now, you do anything you want to, and I, I, I'll even pray for you. I'll pray for Brother Falwell. He has the ear of some uh, high-up people, so I pray for him. I pray God use him. Uh, they tell me it's pretty uh, authentic that uh, uh, Jerry Falwell's going to run for president of the United States. Well, I, I never voted but one time. I might vote for him. I wouldn't vote for him to be the president of the Baptist Fellowship, but I might vote for him to be president. Amen. He said he can't even run the church. Well, the rest of them ain't doing too good anyway. But anyway, I'm not uh, politicking this morning. I'm telling you that we can have wisdom to deal with this age that we live in. And that will only come through 
the study of the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. Now, if you study the doctrine, you know where you're at. You know exactly where you're going, and you even know the end. So if you know the end, that shows you how to deal with this age. Now, we need that end-time faith. Now, end-time faith will show you how to deal with this age right now. And uh, we're not going to deal with this age and this uh, regimented, uh, this regimented uh, religion we got. All right? Now, let, let me give you this last thing. It'll give joy to the saved that justice will be carried out. Now, many times we look around and uh, we see things going on that should not be going on. We see, and never, never has been in history where uh, I, I noticed like uh, in the state of Michigan, uh, uh, the pastor there told me a while back, I preached a meeting there, and he said it is nearly impossible to get a child molester convicted in this state. Uh, I was in a certain church and uh, I hear a good while back, and a man uh, had been uh, uh, molesting a little girl, and they caught him there. And they took him before the judge, and the judge turned him loose, and that man moved to another state. And I said to the pastor, I said, why didn't they do something? He said, because the judge is a child molester himself. Well, naturally, he'd be very lenient on the child molester. But what if he was trying a fundamentalist? He wouldn't be too, be too lenient on him. I noticed out there in Texas, they catch a guy, you know, and uh, uh, he stole somebody's 25, 30 cows, and he took them and sold them, and, uh, and uh, the next morning, he's out of jail. Lester Roloff, he's put in jail for, because he won't take a license to run his church, and uh, no way to make money. That's uh, strange, isn't it? But when you get to study the doctrine of second coming, It'll give you the joy to realize, regardless of what they did to Lester. And you know, I thought about this a lot of times. Brother Roloff was sailing along there, and his plane crashed. And within two hours after that plane crashed, the state of Texas voted for the man who was completely against the Roloff Enterprises and said he'd shut it down. He run on the ticket, I'll shut her down, and they voted on a Tuesday. And on the same Tuesday, Lester Roloff died and went to heaven. God said to me just very plainly, they've rejected my man and they've accepted the devil's man. Now, I could have went home and cried over that if I didn't know the end. But see, my problem is I've read the last chapter out of that book. That's my problem. I was reading a little book last night and every now and then I'll turn over and read the back of it. It gets so uh, involved. I said, I wonder how this thing going to turn out. And I read the last chapter, and when you read the last chapter, you can go back and just kind of read it easy, you know. You say, well, uh, everything's going to be okay. And that's the way it is. I don't care uh, what the state does or what kind of laws they pass on. This thing's going to turn out right. Because the Lord said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And in my Father or house are many mansions. In that little old funny Bible, it says, in my Father's house are many rooms. One of my boys raised in the ghetto, he said that some guy was reading that at a funeral one day, and he said he must have been raised in the ghetto apartment project. Many rooms. Amen. No, no, it says many mansions. Many mansions in God's house. Now, it'll give you joy to know that justice is going to be done. The murder, the molester. He goes free today, but that day, the Bible said that the sea gave up the dead. And you know, people have sneaked around and done things and connived against God's men. But one day, God, every secret shall be judged by that man, Christ Jesus. Now, what about this doctrine, preacher? The second coming of Christ, this will do. It'll keep you out of some things. It'll keep you out of sin. Now, you're, you're, not going to, you're not going to do anything wickedly wrong when you think that the Lord might come right then. You're not going to do it. Why? You think the Lord's going to come. It'll keep you out of modernism. It'll keep you after the souls of men. Now, you don't sleep too good. You go in and lay down in your bed, and you say, well, I, I believe I'll go to sleep. And just by the time you start to go to sleep, you say, you know, the Lord could come tonight. Then you reach over and pick up a telephone, you call that boy in a distant city or that girl or that old friend, that old acquaintance, and said, uh, have you ever been saved? 
Brother John told me, he said last night he woke up in the middle of the night thinking about an old friend. They had been boys together, and he recommended him to a TV thing, and he become to a, 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 I think, a sports announcer on that TV. And John said, I, I've been praying for that man. And he said, I believe the Lord's going to let me really witness to him when I go home in a few days. What are you talking about? When a man gets to thinking the Lord could come, he looks around at his children, and he gets serious about praying for them. He looks around at his family and his friends. He gets serious about praying. He forgets all them ugly answers he has. You know, the Bible does not say that he that winneth an argument is wise. But it does say he that winneth souls is wise. And I'm noticing fundamental ranks nowadays, it's uh, more blessed to win the argument than it is the soul. And sometimes when you lose the argument, it might cause you to win the soul. But we'd rather be right than win the Lord. Amen, Brother Wood. But this doctrine of the second coming of Christ. Now, in a few days, they took the Lord Jesus to a hill called Calvary, and he began to, they began to do what the wicked religious world wanted to do, crucify him. And in the back of John's mind, he said, did you hear what he said? I will come again. John watched him die, watched the blood run down that hill that day, watched him put him in a tomb, but John went back out of that grave. What was he doing out of that grave? He knew that he had to get up because he said to come again. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, I think it is about verse 8, or verse 11 or 12, he said, Why stand you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus shall come in like manner as you've seen him go away. They saw the Lord go away. And they stand there gazing up into heaven. And he said, why don't you get busy doing what God told you to do? This same Jesus is going to come back again. And I believe we've got this 25 years ago was the, was the driving force of the independent rights. This was the thing that, that caused us to send out missionaries and win the loss was the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. And somehow it has become an intellectual thing. We know it. We've studied it. We believe it. We can teach everything about it. We can tell you we're in the grace age. Here's the rapture. And here's the tribulation. Here's the second coming. Here's the millennium and all that. But there's nothing in our heart of expectancy. Expectancy. John said, when he started to close out the book, he said, Even so come, Lord Jesus. What's that sound like? John sitting on the island of Patmos and been there forever how long? And uh, everybody else is gone and religion's gone and not even any way to win a soul, but John had one hope. And in his heart was saying, come today. Come today. And this would be a good day for him to come. You said, I don't believe he's going to come today, Brother Wood. Well, that's what he said. He said, in the hour that you think not, the Son of Man comes. That's what he said. You know, there's a funny thing about God. He knows all about man. He knows our unbeliefs. He knows our doubts and fears. And he said, so in the hour that you think not, the Son. So this doctrine that your pastor has been teaching you all these years is a very important doctrine if it's experienced. The second coming of Christ is an experience to me. It's not something I just believe. It's not just something I believe. Many times I've been on my knees with a man, and that man would trust Christ as his Savior. And I'd say, come, Lord Jesus, it'd be a good time to come. And many times I've been dealing with a man and having him by the hand, and me and him would start to pray, and I'd say, Lord, just, just wait a minute, just, just a minute. I, I don't care, I... Years ago, 30 years ago, I went to, took my wife to the hospital to have a, our first boy. And I went over to Dr. J. Frank Norris, hadn't been dead many years, in a couple of years. And I went to a couple's home, very prominent people in that town. And they asked me to stay in their home. And I spent the night. I forget their name now. But uh, that night, we started to lay down to go to bed. And 
they read the Bible, and they read something about the second coming. And I'll never forget it. A man, maybe 50 years old, hair was white. He walked to the thing and looked at him. He said, I declare, Mom, just as earnest and honest, big, fancy home. He said, he didn't come last night. Maybe, Mama, he'll come today. I'll never forget that as long as I live. He just got up like he was completely disappointed and said, Mama, he didn't come last night. Maybe he'll come today. You know what's in that man and woman? They was expecting the Lord to come. And many times, all the time, we want him to come is when we're having some disaster or some financial problem or some problem in our lives or church or whatever. Then we want him to come. But my eye today and all of the truth of my soul, wouldn't it be a good day for the Lord to come? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning for this great, precious doctrine that we learned the first year we were saved 32 years ago. We've studied it. We've run a pencil through the Bible. We've looked at everything about the second coming and sometimes just drowned in ourselves in the doctrine. But yet, Lord, it's been an experience to us to know that our Lord one day shall really truly come. Trumpet shall sound and we'll rise to meet the Lord. And that great drama of redemption will unveil as we see the King of kings and the Lord of lords sit down on the throne of David and see the prime minister himself, David the king, begin to take over this world and see God begin to rule and reign for a thousand years. Father, we're looking forward to that great, that great drama when God unveils it all. But in our soul today, Lord, that doctrine, that precious, that precious, priceless doctrine has done some things for us. And we stop and say thank you for the principles of the Word of God, the second coming of our blessed Lord. Bless this doctrine to the hearts of some of these who maybe have forgotten that they were purged from their sin. Some of them maybe who are young in the Lord and don't know much about it. May they realize that this great doctrine will stabilize them in the times of storm. Carry them through. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.